That's so good, isn't it? Good evening. Welcome back. Uh, thank you for joining us online. If you are, before uh, we get started, when we were putting tonight's service together, we thought, why don't we do some Gaither stuff? And I came up with this little thing called Gaither with us, won't you? And you know what the response would be, right? Why not? So if y'all would please stand.
blood can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of jesus This I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh. Father, thank you for this Lord's Day. Lord, I pray that you would be with Travis as he brings a message, be with the folks that couldn't be here for whatever reason. Lord, I pray that you would just bless us. Thank you for loving us the, the way you do. And Lord, thank you for music that speaks even to the hardest hearts. Thank you so much, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done? He drops of grief can repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first all the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and 
I worship with these guys. They 
do something to my spirit and with my spirit and for my spirit that uh, doesn't happen in any, any other way. We are in the book of Acts. It's been three or four Sunday nights since we've gotten back to our main study on Sunday evening. But we are in Acts chapter 4 and we are at verse 32. Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. I've got six, 17 minutes after 6. I'll let you out by 7. Is that all right? Tells you it may take us a little while to get through the entirety of this chapter. If we get to 7 o'clock and I'm not finished, you can leave and I'll finish without you. <laughs> Man, everything in the early church was going great. It was going great. People were walking in unity, right? We talked about that. They were giving themselves for the good of one another. The Lord was adding to the church. People were being saved. It was just like the church ought to be. I want you to look at the end of chapter 4 in verse 32. It describes the condition of the church. All of the believers were one in heart in mind, it doesn't mean they were all thinking just alike. It means that they were saying, well, if you think that, fine. If I think what I think is fine, but we're not going to let it get in the way of our fellowship together. Notice this. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And notice carefully verse 33, with great power, with great power, the apostles testified to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses, they would sell them and they would bring the money from the sales and they would put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Verse 36, and Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles also called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, or perhaps your text says son of consolation. Mr. Encourager, he sold a field that he owned, and he brought the money and he put it at the feet of the apostles. Now, put that in perspective. Here you have an early church. The people were together in their mind, the thinking. They were together in unity, in their heart. They were just, if they owned something and somebody had a need, they would sell it, take the resources, give to the person in need. And God was doing a powerful, powerful work. Then you come to chapter 5. Now there was a man named Ananias. Together with his wife Sapphira, they sold a piece of property, and with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, and he brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Well, go back to verse 37 and look at it for just a moment. Verse 36. Barnabas sold a field and he brought the money and he put it at the apostles' feet and there was a sense of recognition for what Barnabas did. Why, well, look what Barnabas did. He had some property. He saw some needs in some people's lives. So old Barnabas went and sold the property and they gave it to those people in need. Well, I don't know about you, but I kind of like recognition every once in a while, don't you? Don't you like it when somebody remembers you for doing something good? I mean... I sort of like a pat on the back now and then. And apparently, 
Ananias and Sapphira did too. Because when Barnabas sold his property, people rejoiced and recognized Barnabas for what he had done. And Ananias and Sapphira said, well, why don't we do that? Why don't we sell something and give the resources? And they agreed. Notice verse 2. With his wife's full knowledge, they kept back part of the money. Now, here's the problem, okay? The problem wasn't that they sold the property and kept some of it back. The problem was they sold the property and implied that the money they gave was all that they got for the property. The property probably, scholars suggest, sold for more money than they thought it would. And when they got a better price for the property, they just said, well, what? Why don't we just, why don't we just keep a little of this for ourselves? We'll give a good amount to the church. We'll, we'll take a good amount of the property's sale and we'll put it at the feet of the apostles. But with his wife's full knowledge, they held some of it back. But they gave what they gave with the implication that it was all of the money they had received when they sold the property. Look at verse 3. And Peter said to Ananias, How is it that Satan has filled your heart and that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Now notice verse 4. Peter is talking to Ananias. He said, Ananias, didn't the property belong to you before you sold it? And after you sold it, wasn't the money yours? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but you've lied to God. By your implication that the money you brought and placed at the Apostles' feet was the exact amount of money that you received for the sale of the property. In doing so, you've not just lied to the church. You've not just lied to the apostles. You've lied to God. I think I've told some of you about an experience I had four or five years ago. Janie and I were at a Western show in Prescott, Arizona. Now, don't call it Prescott. They'll correct you. It's not Prescott. It's Prescott. We were at a Western show in Prescott, Arizona, at the rodeo grounds. And just by chance, our little booth, our tables, were right next to another man who happened to live in Prescott. And he was going to be there for the Friday and Saturday show, but Saturday night he was going to leave and head to Las Vegas to an antique gun show. I began looking at some of the items that the gentleman had on the table, and I, f I found one particular Indian trade knife, and that Indian trade knife was in a scabbard that was beaded. Beautiful, beautiful scabbard. And I said, tell me about the knife and the scabbard. He said, oh, it's an 1800s knife. He said, but the real value here is in the scabbard. This is a Hopi beaded scabbard. Rare. Hard to come by. I said, well, what do you want for it? And he gave me a price. I looked at my wife. She said, it's your money. And I bought it. 
Well, he had been an engineer and had retired. He knew that I had been a pastor and had retired. We bundled everything up, went home for the night, came back on Saturday morning about 10 o'clock. He sits next to me and he said, I, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, you still have that knife and scabbard I sold you yesterday? And I said, yeah. I thought he was going got a better price from somebody and he wanted, he said, can I have that back? I'll give you your money back. Could I have it back? I said, well, yeah, I guess. Why? He said, I lied to you. I lied to you. That's not an 1800s Indian trade knife. And that's not a Hopi beaded scabbard. I think it was made in Korea. When I found out you were a preacher, my conscience started bothering me. And my mama told me, don't ever, ever, ever lie to a preacher. And he gave me my money back. I don't know how you view culture. But you and I live in a culture that struggles mightily with honesty. It is so easy to lie. It is so easy to misrepresent truth. Last Wednesday, after Bible study, I committed a sin. I went to Minchie's. You ever been to Minchie's? Minchie's is an ice cream store on 82nd, just down from where the old Anderson's Jewelers used to be. Now do you know what I'm talking about? Minchie's? Here's how Minchie's works. You go in and you get a cup. And they have this rack or this bar of different types of ice cream. And you go to the particular one you like and you pull a lever and that ice cream starts coming out. And you can hold it there as long as you want to, but you're gonna pay for your ice cream based on the weight of that cup. So I shut it off and I go over and I get some pecans and I put that on there and then I go over and I get a little bit of marshmallow and I push that and then I get some strawberries and I put that in there and push that and I go over and I put it on the scale and she looks at it and says, that'll be $5.82. Well, what bothered me about that experience was that there was kind of a little line in front of me. And the guy directly in front of me had gone through all of the same stuff I did and he had filled his cup to overflowing. And he was like two or three people back. And he had a spoon, and he was just spooning that stuff in his mouth, going just as hard and fast as you can. He getting a bulge with ice cream. You know why? You know why he did that? Because he didn't want to pay for as much as he got. I'm telling you people, it's easy to be dishonest. And Peter recognized that in Ananias. Peter knew that he was not telling the truth. And he said, you didn't lie to the church. You didn't lie to the apostles. You lied to God. That man who sold me the knife didn't want it on his conscience that he lied to a preacher. I hope that guy at Minchie's got indigestion by the time he got home. <laughs> 
But let me tell you something. There's one person you better not lie to, and that's the Spirit of God. Don't lie to the Spirit of God. Satan, Satan filled the heart of Ananias. Well, notice something. He said, after it was sold, wasn't the money still yours? What made you think that you could do such a thing? You've lied to God. And when Ananias heard this, he fell down dead. Scholars suggest that he was so alarmed in the fact that his lie had been discovered that most likely he had a heart attack and died. Some young men came and they wrapped up his body and they carried him out and buried him. Now notice verse 7. About three hours later, his wife came in, Sapphira, not knowing what had happened. Now here's an interesting aspect of this story. Do you know what Sapphira means? Beautiful. Do you know what Ananias means? Grace of God. Here is one who is named beautiful and one who is named grace of God agreeing together to lie. And so three hours later, his wife came in and not knowing what had happened, Peter asked her, Tell me something, Sapphira. Is, is the money that you laid at the apostles' feet, you and Ananias, is that the amount that you got for the property? Is that all you got when you sold the property? Look at verse 8. Yeah, yes, she said, that was the price. And Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. And at that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. The young men came in and they found her dead and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And notice verse 11, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. It had got my attention. Wouldn't it have gotten yours? Notice in verse 11, this is the first time in the book of Acts the word church is mentioned. Verse 12, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all of the believers used to meet together in Solomon's porch. Now I've looked this up. This is not a little porch. You step outside of our east doors here, that's a little porch. Solomon's porch was a massive place. And so when all of the people would get together, they would get together under this colonnade, this porch. In verse 13, no one dared join them even though they were highly regarded by the people. Now, that's an interesting thing being stated in verse 13. That the church was so in tune together, that the church was in such unity together, that the people were moving 
with such oneness in spirit together that those who were on the outskirts of that believing community saw the depth of the level of the commitment of this early church and they simply said, we cannot, we can't identify with that. We're not where they are. But another unusual thing happened in verse 14. Nevertheless, more men and women believed in the Lord. And they were added to the church. Verse 15. And as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that, now watch this, they laid them in the streets so that Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. And crowds gather from towns, neighboring communities around Jerusalem, and they brought the sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Wow. Just the shadow of the robe of Peter healed people. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. Do you know what healed the people? Their faith in God. Re remember that story in the New Testament about the lady, Jesus was on his way to, to see about the daughter of a nobleman and she was among the crowd and Jesus passed by and she had been sick for what, 12 years? And she reached out and she touched the cloak, the hem of the garment Jesus was wearing, and she was well. She tried everything she could think of, but when she touched the garment, what, let, let me ask you a question. What, was the garment Jesus was wearing, was it kind of magical? Did it have magic? All she had to do, bzz, you know. What healed her? Her faith. Her faith. And these people, now watch this, had such faith in what the people of God were doing. They would brought their sick and laid them in the street and said, maybe Peter will come by and maybe the shadow of his garment will cover them and they'll be healed. Peter's garment never healed anybody, but the faith of the people did. Verse 17, well, all of this stuff got people's attention. The high priest and all of the associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in jail. Look, look at verse 19. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Was that a real angel? Now, look at me for just a minute. Was that, was that an angel with wings kind of flittering around and he kind of flittered down and kind of turned the lock and the apostles got away? Do you know sometimes in the Bible... Humans were referred to as doing the work of an angelic host. Here's what I think happened. The jailer fell asleep and one of the believers came and unlocked the, the jail and let the apostles out. And when the apostles got out, they ran for the hills, right? Look at verse 20. Go to the temple courts. Tell the people about this new life. And at daybreak, that's what the angel said, and at daybreak they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. And when the high priest and the associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin and the full assembly of the elders of Israel. 
And they sent them down to the jail to pick up the apostles and bring them back. Verse 22, but when they arrived at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, we found the jail currently locked. The guards are standing by the doors. But when they opened the doors, wasn't anybody inside. And on hearing this report, verse 24, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest were at a loss, wondering what this was going to lead to. And then all of a sudden, verse 25, someone came and said, you looking for those guys you had in jail? He said, well, yeah, but they're not there anymore. He said, well, I'll tell you where they are. They're in the temple court. Verse 27, and they were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin, and they were questioned by the high priest. And the high priest said, we gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. He said, yet you've gone around Jerusalem and you've taught everywhere you could get somebody to listen. And you've made it seem, now watch carefully in verse 28, as if we were guilty of this man's blood. You made it seem like we're responsible for the death of this man. Does that catch your attention at all? Does it? Do you see it? He won't even say the name Jesus. He says, this man. And guess what Peter said? Should surprise you, bashful as he was. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross, and God has exalted him to his own right hand. He's the prince and savior that might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Well, let's put that in a loose translation, all right? Chief priest, we're going to let you guys off this time. By golly, you better not do it again. We better not hear another word about you going around teaching about this Jesus who died on the cross being raised from the dead. Don't do it. Peter says, well, say that if you want to. But we can't cease but to preach. Christ crucified. Well, verse 33, when they heard this, they were furious. And they wanted to put them to death. But there was a Pharisee, look at verse 34, there was a Pharisee named Gamaliel. He was a teacher of the law who was honored by all of the people who stood in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for just a little while. Now follow this train of thought. They take the apostles and they put them outside. So I guess they won't hear what they're talking about. And Gamaliel, this wise, wise teacher, said, now listen, men of Israel, you better be careful with what you do to these men. He said, remember that some time ago there was a man named Thedius who appeared and he claimed to be somebody? 
And there were about 400 men who rallied behind him, and he was killed, and all of his followers dispersed. And Thedius and his followers, they, they came to nothing. Look at verse 37. And after him, Judas the Galilean came along. It was in the days of the census, and he had a band of people, and they revolted. He was killed, and everyone who followed him scattered. He said, when it comes to these apostles, to these men, let me tell you something. I advise you to leave them alone. Let them go. For if their purpose is of human origin, what will happen to it? What does your Bible say? If it's of human origin, it will fail. In verse 39, but if God is in it, you can't stop it. And if you try to stop it, you're going to be fighting against God. Folks, let's nail something down right here. Let's nail it down. If God is in it, you better leave it alone. Don't trifle with what God is doing. Don't try to get your hand in there and stir it all up because it doesn't look like you think it ought to look. Gamaliel was right. If this is just a human movement, it'll die of its own accord. You won't have to do a single thing. It'll just die. But if God is in it, you better leave it alone or you will be working and fighting against God. Would that not be a good word of advice for us? A few years ago, I, I became terribly upset. Emotionally upset to the point that I was sick, literally sick, physically ill. Because a group of people in our community decided that the churches in town weren't doing enough to reach the lost. So they were going to start another church that would do what the other churches in town we're not doing. I had a wonderful office suite in Plainview. It was the nicest office suite a person could ever have, nicest one I ever had, nicest one I will ever have. And they built me a special door that I could enter and exit without having to go through the office complex. Do you know where those, those people planted that church? Would you like to guess? Right in front of that door. And every time I stepped out of my office, there it was. There it was. I cannot tell you how much that ate on me. I went to a man who I thought to be very, very wise, a very mature Christian. He's an attorney, sat in his office. I said, this isn't right. This shouldn't be happening. We're doing everything we can to reach the lost. And somebody come along and say, well, you're not doing enough. We're going to have to start another church to get it done. 
And I remember he leaned back and he said, Pastor, get a hold of yourself. If this is a thing done by man, it won't last. But if God is in this, you don't want to have anything to do with trying to put out the fire. Don't mess with what God is at work doing. Well, they flogged them, verse 40. Sent them on their way, said, whatever you do, don't talk about this Jesus. In verse 41, it, it is such a wonderful statement. The apostles left the Sanhedrin. Now, now don't miss this. Rejoicing because they had been counted worthy to suffer disgrace for the name the name of Jesus well day after day in the temple courts from house to house they didn't stop they kept teaching and preaching and proclaiming the good news. You can hear them now if you listen. Jesus is Messiah. I had an un usual little thought that when the angel let those apostles out of jail he said well go ahead and disobey the government because they'll, somebody will come let you out of jail they'll lock you up but you'll get out don't worry about it and I decided this week I was going to do the best I could to trace down what happened to these people, these men we've been talking about in chapter 5, who would cease not to teach and preach Jesus as crucified Savior. Matthew was beheaded. Mark died in Alexandria after being drugged through the city streets. Luke was hanged in Greece. Peter was crucified upside down in Rome. James was beheaded in Jerusalem. James the Less was beaten with clubs and died. Philip was hanged. Bartholomew was whipped and beaten until he died. Andrew was crucified. Thomas was run through with a spear. Jude was executed by a firing squad with arrows. Matthias was stoned to death, then beheaded. The only one of the apostles that was not murdered was John. And he was boiled in oil. You think they were saying to each other, oh, go ahead, ignore those people, just preach the gospel. If we get thrown in jail, somebody's going to come let us out. Don't think that for one moment. All but one of them laid down their life for the sake of the gospel. Hmm. Well, let's pray together. Father, what power what power is in the gospel of Christ? Crucify, 
raised from the dead, seated at the very right hand of the Father. Such truth, such powerful truth that men would literally die for it to be preached. So Father, we ask you today in this place among these people how could we possibly do anything less? Give us a good evening, we pray in your name. Amen. See y'all. How are you doing? That's okay. Do you remember?